Okay, we are ready to go. I'd like to call to order the regular board meeting of Tuesday, December 7th, 2021. As is our custom, we begin our board meetings with the singing of the national anthem. We are very honored today to have a pre recorded video of students from Deer Run singing O Canada. We would like to acknowledge the traditional territories and oral practices of the Blackfoot Nations, which include the Tsitsika, the Pikani, and the Gaina. We also acknowledge the Sutena and Yehe Nakoda First Nations, the Métis Nation Region 3, and all people who make their homes in the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome all trustees, superintendents, staff, and public participating in today's virtual public board meeting. It's so nice to see your faces. Our first item of business is to approve the agenda for today's meeting. Mrs. Miner, do you have any changes that need to be noted? Madam Chair, the following ag agenda change request has been received. That item 9.2.2, the 2021-2022 school enrollment report be removed from the consent agenda. Could I have a motion that the agenda be approved with the proposed changes? Uh, so moved. I will now call on each individually to indicate whether you are in favor or opposed to the motion. Trustee Bolger. In favor. Trustee Close. In favor. Trustee Dennis. In favor, thank you. Trustee Downey. In favor. Trustee May. In favor. Trustee Bukadinovich. In favor. I also vote in favor of the motion. The motion is carried unanimously. Next on our agenda is the annual monitoring of the operational expectations for treatment of employees. Christopher, uh, Chief Husey, would you please introduce the report? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, trustees, uh, today, uh, today we present the, uh, the monitoring report for operational expectation for treatment of employees. The data collected for this monitoring report applies to the 2020-2021 school year. We have included data indicating evidence of a safe, supportive, and respectful organization with clear personnel rules and procedures, standards and practices for recruitment, and adherence with requirements for board approval of and ratification of collective agreements. The evidence presented in the report before you today indicates compliance with the 11 indicators that remain applicable to this particular OE. As a result of decisions taken by the Board of Trustees, two indicators are not applicable for the 2020-21 school year. At this time, Madam Chair, I'd like to invite Superintendent of uh, Human Resources, Rob Armstrong, uh, to walk uh, walk the board through the reports and we'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Madam Chair.
Chair Hack and trustees, <clears throat> as Chief Superintendent UC stated, the report uh, notes compliance on all of the measures that remain applicable during the year in question. Two of the measures are not applicable in this report due to direction and decision of the Board of Trustees. As highlighted in the report, in November 2020, the Board directed the Chief Superintendent to bring forward a recommendation on how to proceed in light of questions with respect to the best way to capture employee feedback and the impacts of COVID-19 on the timing of the anticipated survey. On October 12, 2021, the Board of Trustees approved a shift to utilizing single topic surveys that will allow CBE to focus on addressing one topic or issue. It's anticipated that this change in focus will enable a process that will be more responsive and effective than the previous survey process. The single survey, single focus survey will be implemented in the 2021-2022 school year and reported on in the 2022-2023 school year. While a final determination has not been made as to the specific timing of the survey and the questions for it, it is anticipated the focus will be related to employee wellness and well-being. I would note as well that as we continue to focus on we continue to focus on strengthening leadership within the organization, with leadership being a key focus area of the education plan. As I noted in my comments to the board last year, this report demonstrates the commitment of CB staff to their work. As with the prior year, excuse me, <clears throat> this past year, the work of staff at all levels and in all parts of the system has highlighted the strengths of the organization. Strengths such as a focus on student success, strong relationships with students and coworkers, and valuing diversity, <coughs> excuse me, have continued to come to the fore. Also, as I noted last year, we could not have exceeded as we have in addressing these challenges without leaders at all levels and in all parts of the organization being able to lead with clarity and compassion. In my comments last year, I spoke hopefully about moving out of the pandemic and building off our success during it. Hopefully the coming year, We'll see that happen. I would be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you. The operational expectations policies define the degree of authority transferred to the chief superintendent as he makes day to day decisions. The Board of Trustees has previously reviewed the reasonable interpretation of this operational expectation and approved that Chief Superintendent reasonably understands the values underlying this policy and that the indicators previously provided by the Chief Superintendent are acceptable to the Board. I now invite any trustee who has questions about the report to offer them to Chief Superintendent. Let, rem let me remind the Board that the purpose of considering this report is to satisfy the Board um, that its policies values were in compliance with during the 2020-2021 school year, so last year. I encourage trustees to limit their questions and comments in support of monitoring. If you'd like to jump in the chat now, if you have any questions or comments. Trustee Dennis. Thank you so much, Chair, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I have a few questions on uh, page 5-5 regarding the professional improvement fellowships and um, I'm guessing that some of my colleagues who are former teachers probably know these answers so I thank them for their patience as I do a little bit of learning myself here this morning or this afternoon sorry. Um, so my first question is what types of professional learning opportunities are eligible under, um, um, under these fellowships? And can you provide some examples of some of the opportunities that our staff took advantage of last year? Uh, through the chair, um, any program that's administered through an accredited accredited institution uh, that falls within the PIP guidelines uh, is a something that can be um, pursued. Uh, that would include it needs to be related in some way to the three-year education plan tied to our system priorities and it must be a course or a program that would aid in furthering the individual's career within the CBE. Uh, there are certain requirements in terms of the amount of service that somebody has to have before they can apply for the, the PIF leave and those leaves can be anywhere from uh, six months to the, the full year depending on the amount of service that they've had. Um, in terms of some examples, quite frequently uh, teachers will pursue things like their master's degree in education for support staff, it's more likely that they're going to pursue a bachelor in education or an education assistant cer certification or something along those lines. Uh, 
Trustee Vukadinovich. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so as a new trustee, as I've learned about the incredible work that our teachers do, I'm learning that CBE teachers have identified that classrooms are becoming increasingly complex. The number of students with complex learning needs has grown by 67% over the past five years. Yet despite the growing complexity, the Calgary Board of Education is underfunded by 80 million per year. What this means, as I understand it, is that the CBE spends 80 million more than we receive from the government of Alberta to adequately support these students. And what I mean by that, this is money that is needed to pay for essentials such as transportation for students with complex needs, English language learning for ELL students, educational assistants, mental health specialists, physical therapists, speech language pathologists, cultural diversity advisors, and more. As a result of receiving less money to pay for these essentials than what we spend on these essentials, I'm worried that we are downloading onto our teachers an expectation that in addition to being skilled educators, they also need to provide support for a wide range of learning, behavioral, physical health needs, and mental health needs. So my question is, are we able to provide supports to our staff to ensure we are supporting the mental health and well-being of our educators? We talk a lot about student mental health and well-being, and that is important, but are we supporting mental health and well-being for our educators? Chair, um, I'd like to, um, I'll get started and certainly uh, invite any of my colleagues to, uh, to, to comment if, uh, if, uh, if necessary. Uh, what my response would be that uh, we, con we, are, we are mindful uh, clearly of the environment that we currently operate. Uh, uh, COVID has been with us for 20 months and I do uh, agree with uh, the premise of the, of the trustee's question in terms of the, uh, uh, the impact uh, that the pandemic uh, certainly it's having not only on educators but on students and families so it's something that we continually uh, are mindful of and there are pros there are steps that we, we are taking to minimize the impact with uh, as trustees have, have heard us say in the past we continue to do all the be all we can to ensure that we minimize uh we minimize all the all the uh, disruptions that happens in schools so that we can focus on teaching and learning Having said that, I know there are support systems that are available to employees to access if they wish to. And I certainly like uh, the Superintendent of H, uh, Superintendent Armstrong could comment on what uh, those supports look like. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, schools uh, are uh, both in formal and informal ways. Informal ways are continued to engage uh, in processes or activities uh, that again continues to center uh, uh, mental health and well-being, recognizing the uh, the impact that we all recognize uh, that uh, it's been a challenge. So I would just invite Superintendent Armstrong to comment on uh, the uh, the supports that employees may avail themselves to uh, in this time as well. Uh, through the chair, yes, the uh, you know, the main support we offer is an um, employee and family assistant program through a uh, Homewood Health, which provides extensive services to support staff uh, as it relates to all sorts of counseling and other needs that they might have as they manage with challenges within the workplace and in their own personal lives. Trustee Dennis, you have a question? I do. Thank you so much, Chair. Um, and thank you, Superintendent Armstrong, for your answers to my last question. Um, you also answered another question that I have, which is really around the consideration of approval in that process. And um, thank you for sharing some of what those criteria might be. Um, that was sort of the due diligence I was hoping to hear about. So thank you so much. Another question that I have regarding the same topic is, can you give some idea of what costs could be incurred by the CBE? in allowing our staff to participate in these um, valuable opportunities. But then also, how do we determine, um, I guess, or do we have a way of determining the, you know, the effectiveness and the return on, on the investment uh, to the CBE for granting such leave? Through the chair. In terms of, of the cost, so if it's a, excuse me, a, a leave, a PIF leave, the cost is for ATA members 70% of their salary for the duration of that leave and for staff association members it's 65% of their salary for the duration of the leave so that that's the cost. Uh, there are also PIFs that are granted that are tuition and books and so we would pay for the tuition and books 
for those individuals uh, for that period of time. In terms of an assessment of the value that we receive from it, we don't do a formal assessment of that, although we do know, for example, that many of the individuals, uh, for teachers, for example, who go and get their master's degrees, then move on to take on administrative roles within the, uh, the system as a master's degree is one of the requirements to, to be a principal or an AP in the system. Trustee Vukadinovich. Uh, I would like to thank you, uh, Chief Superintendent Usi and Superintendent Armstrong, for your answers to my last question. My next question is: um, Despite the fact that a number of students with complex needs have, the, that the number of students with complex needs has grown significantly over the past five years, our teachers are doing an amazing job. Uh, when you compare CBE results to provincial provincial results, our students are doing do very well. And that is a testament to how, how hard our students work, a testament to how well our parents provide supports for student success, a testament to the support and funding we receive from Alberta taxpayers through the government of Alberta, and a testament to how talented our teachers are here at the CBE. For example, when it comes to PASS, the Provincial Achievement Test, CBE students in Grade 6 outperform the province at the acceptable standard and at the standard of excellence in all measures. To provide another example, when it comes to diploma exams, in 10 of 11 12 grade in 10 of grade of 11 grade 12 subjects stu cbe students outperform the province at the standard of excellence so given how good our teachers are in the aggregate i'm sure that some of them must be award-winning teachers so my question is can you tell me whether any of our teachers principals or other staff members were recognized for doing award-winning work over the past year or so Through the chair, thank you, Trustee Vigodinovich, for that question. Uh, whether it's individual teachers, teacher teams, or entire staff, uh, certainly we have incredible educators working together and support staff as well to serve our students and achieve those successes. While awards often do name individuals, uh, we always recognize that, and, and as do our staff, that it's also part of the team that they're on that set those conditions and the work that is done collectively. Uh, over this last year and a, and a bit, we have had a number of teachers and administrators win, win awards. Uh, I'll give an example, or I'll give some examples of some of them. I would add that this is not always exhaustive, and there are many different ways in which uh, staff are recognized, whether through school councils or through different community awards uh, and different connections that they have within their individual school communities. But I, I do want to provide you some examples of some of those that, that have been recognized most recently. Uh, we've had a number of teachers and administrators uh, be awarded recognition through INSPIRE, which is a national award recognizing Indigenous educators who've made important contributions to community-based education and honor the principles of Indigenous knowledge. Uh, most recently, Education Director Lori Pritchard, as well as System Principal Michelle Ranger, have been recognized uh, by the organization. Uh, the principal at Petoyas Family School, Ikanayuka, was recognized with the Great uh, Neighbor Award through the Hitman. And we have had many teachers over the years who have been awarded the Prime Minister's Awards for Teaching Excellence. Most recently, Christine Gates Leach, a home education teacher at Windsor Park School, as well as Courtney Walcott at Western Canada High School, uh, now City Councillor. And uh, those were recently announced as well. Uh, Top 40 Under 40 by Calgary's Avenue Magazine, Caitlin Gallican Lowe uh, was named as a Top 40 Under 40 there, a teacher in one of our schools. Um, Jack FM also uh, awarded a teacher at William Reed School as uh, Calgary's best teacher. Uh, Mademoiselle Je Jessica walsh Moreau uh, was recognized there. Um, we've had a teacher and in programming at Centennial High School featured in Canadian Geographic. Uh, teacher Adam Robb for his work uh, with some of the CTS courses and different uh, community opportunities that he had created. As well, uh, last year, both Simon Fraser and AE Cross School had individual staff members as well as work across the school recognized with the National Inclusive Education Award. Those are some of the examples. There are many more uh, of different ways that individuals and groups and staff 
are recognized for the work, but absolutely uh, there are many incredible educators working across our schools in support of student success. Thank you for that. I'm going to remind trustees you can jump in the chat at any point to add if you've got a question or comment. Um, I got trustee Dennis with a question. Thank you very much. Uh, so this is the last question on the um, PIF leave. Um, so I, I noticed in this report that the leaves were, the, you know, from five weeks to 10 months when I looked at last year's report. It mentioned the 12 month period, which um, the superintendent also mentioned that it could be up to 12 months. I, the question I guess I have around, um, and Superintendent Armstrong, with some of the um, examples that you provided around how these leaves are being used by our staff, um, you know, if they're pursuing their master's or their B. Ed, obviously that's going to take longer than a year. And so I'm just wondering, is there, do we, um, in the process of approval, do we allow for that? Um, multi-year option or do they have to apply for each year individually and um, kind of related to that I guess too is is there amount of time that needs to pass between leaves to be able to do some of that work um, I know earlier you mentioned that you had to be under the employee of CBE for a certain amount of time before qualifying for a leave but I'm wondering about between between leaves when they're working towards you know, one goal as opposed to, you know, all this, you know, changing to something else. If it's towards the same goal that each year would be needed for, can they plan to do that for multiple years? Looking to uh, uh, a type of program where it's going to take them more than that one year, they can then apply for a general leave at that point and continue on with that if that's what they would like to do. In a lot of cases, two people would continue on on a part-time basis and complete it while working as well would be another option. Uh, once you've uh, been approved for a PIF, you need to wait five more years before applying for another PIF, the uh, leave or funding. So it really is intended for that one year period, but there certainly is accommodated uh, that people can have longer term general leaves that follow that. As trustees think about this, I've got a question. Um, page seven of the report, indicator one, um, looks at 90% of employees who pass their probationary period will still be employed with CBE at the two year anniversary. You mention as, as part of being in compliant with this, the end of 2020-21 school year, that 92.23% of continuous employees remained employed with CB for two years after completing their probationary period. Um, that's a very high number, at, but it talks about just continuous employees. What about the employees who have passed the two-year probationary period and are not continuous employees yet? For example, um, teachers who are on temp contracts who have permanent certification, so they've they pass their probationary period. And I guess as a part to that, uh, what is the average amount of time a teacher spends temping or guest teaching versus on to continuous contract? Chair Hack, uh, the, uh, the measure itself is focused on continuous staff, both permanent, uh, both the uh, certificated and non-certificated because it's a measure of retention and, and what we're doing there. We don't track non-continuous or non-permanent situations in the same way because there's a, any number of reasons why an individual may or may not continue on, which is different than the commitment that's made when we get to the point of somebody being continuous or permanent. It, it, as With respect to things like uh, how long it might take a teacher to get up continuous contract that's very difficult to determine any kind of an average as you're likely aware a number of subs choose to be subs on an ongoing or, or permanent basis some people prefer a, a series of temporary contracts with the ability to have some time off in between it can also be impacted by things like the specialty area in which an individual is focused and so you're more likely to get a continuous contact contract quicker if you're teaching languages, for example, than if you're a, a generalist elementary teacher. So any number of factors that go in there make it uh, virtually impossible to come up with sort of an average number uh, for that. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Dennis has got a question. Thank you very much. I'll stick to the same page that the chair did with her question. So page 5-7. 
and it's around the um, uh, like when staff are desiring to become a principal or assistant principal. So I know that the system has done some really good work um, in recent history um, around improving the training that's available for those individuals that are seeking those administrative positions. And here we're talking about retention. And I guess um, what I'm wondering about sort of beyond retention, can you articulate some of the advantages that have been realized by the system by um, improving these training opportunities for uh, individuals that are seeking those administrative postings? Certainly, uh, we have uh, provide both uh, aspiring cohorts for assistant principals and for principal positions. So those are individuals seeking to prepare for those roles. We also uh, continue to provide new uh, AP or assistant principal cohorts as well as new principal cohorts. So it's ongoing support following uh, successful moving into the role. Uh, in terms of benefits to the system, some of the key benefits for the aspiring cohort roles and the training that's available there is first and foremost, it provides an opportunity for individuals to be connected to others across the CBE and across the city in a wide range of experiences to be able to develop understanding together and also to recognize uh, where their individual experiences then align most importantly to the leadership quality standards as laid out by Alberta Education as well as CBE policies. So being able to spend time applying those policies and the standards to case studies and the like really does allow individuals the opportunity to develop their thinking and their planning and action and understanding as they move forward. Uh, as in addition to having those supportive networks as well, uh, the direct links and opportunity to explore operational decisions and processes as appropriate to their role is a key element to ensuring that staff are able to execute the uh, processes that are laid out to ensure safety, um, access, and, and just essentially understand all related policies as it is connected to uh, the accountability of either the assistant principal and uh, the principal. Those elements create a greater level of stability, a greater degree of confidence and competence across the system, and also allow for an increased opportunity to uh, share communi important communication and understanding with aspiring leaders as well as new individuals or individuals who are new to the role. Okay, I'll ask if there are any more questions from the trustees in regards to OE4 monitoring. Trustee Dennis. Thank you very much. Um, sorry, I'm trying to wait long enough to make sure that my audio kicks in. Um, so I have a few questions on page 5-6 and it's about the public interest disclosure and code of conduct um, pieces. So I have a number of questions there. I guess the first one I'll start with is how do we determine whether a public interest disclosure report will be acted upon or not? Thank you. Uh, through the chair, um, as you uh, may know, the legislation uh, Public Interest Disclosure Act applies to all employees um, and it identifies a structured process in that legislation and regulations um, uh, that's reflected in CBE policy and administrative regulations about how we go about uh, addressing these kinds of complaints. Um, so disclosures are reviewed in light of uh, the legislative definition of a wrongdoing, which is what is covered by the legislation, um, whether the complaint itself discloses sufficient information that would allow for an assessment of uh, the application of the law, um, whether it's a matter that should be addressed under another act or another uh, administrative regulation within CBE or another sort of process such as the human rights uh, tribunal or a grievance arbitration process. Um, we also assess around uh, criminality and uh, any um, imminent risk of harm to others. That's going to inform how quickly we respond to it. Uh, it's also looked at through the lens of whether it's frivolous or vexatious or not made in good faith. Um, and then again, there's a, a sort of in-depth analysis of whether um, the complaint really is one that is uh, best addressed under this uh, particular policy framework. Um, generally, we won't investigate if uh, it doesn't fall under the act, so it doesn't constitute a wrongdoing as defined. 
Um, it is for, if it's frivolous or vexatious or uh, not made in good faith, we may decline to investigate. Um, there's been an, uh, a period of more than two years since the alleged event has occurred. There's a sort of limitation period there. Um, or the assessment of all the information provided in relation to the complaint uh, indicates that a, an investigation is not warranted. Um, or the matter's already been dealt with or can be dealt with, again, through other forms or remedies. So those are that's sort of the initial analysis that occurs. Um, depending on how much information is in the complaint, as designated officer, I may follow up with the complainant to secure more information. I may contact others in the organization to gather information, and I use that information to inform whether there's a full-blown investigation under the Act required. Thank you. Is there, Trustee Dennis, do you have a follow up to that? I have a few questions related to that topic. So put them in the chat one at a time to give others an opportunity if they also have a question. But can I go ahead with my next question, Jer? Yes, please do. <laughs> thank you so much. All right. Um, so, and thank you so much um, for that explanation around sort of the legislation and, and appreciated that additional information. I think. There is a level of transparency that's afforded because because of the way it's laid out, and so um, I appreciate that. In terms of, I guess, bringing it a little bit closer to home um, and how you know how we manage um, you know such complaints, I guess, what are some of the things that we do as a system to maintain maintain confidence in the process? Yeah, so I think you know we don't get a, a high volume of them, um, but some of the things that um, we do is we uh, reflect sort of at the completion of the management of a complaint uh, to see if there's any process related tweaks that need to be made or any communication um, related uh, steps that need to be taken. Um, the, the, the policy framework and the, uh, and the um, protocol attached this to this legislation was updated in mid-2019 to reflect legislative changes and I anticipate it's going to be updated again uh, in the next year or so because uh, there are some recommended legis legislative changes uh, that are uh, coming forward. Um, but we also use um, uh, the administrative regulation policy process. Our policy coordinator has a cross-functional review committee. Uh, she uses um, that committee to reflect on ARs and to um, receive feedback about what, what ARs may have to be adjusted or may have to be adjusted. Um, and uh, as the designated officer, again, I have uh, had opportunity to communicate and liaise with the Public Interest Commissioner, uh, which is the body that has overarching oversight for this particular piece of legislation and can do its own investigations. Um, and through my liaising with them, I've um, consulted with them about process and received some good feedback about how to adjust things or be responsive. Um, under the policy to complainants. The other thing I do is I make sure that I follow up with the individual complainants. They they receive, you know, responses from me formally as designated officer, but I make an effort to uh, explain to people why we're moving to the next step or not moving to the next step so that at least people have an understanding of whether the complaint fell within the legislative framework or not, and if not, why. Thank you for that. Um, are there any other trustees who have questions? Make sure you get in the chat question, comment, follow up. That'd be great. Uh, Trustee Dennis has another question. All right. Um, and I'll maybe package my last two questions together because I think they could potentially be tied together. Um, first of all, I just want to thank you so much for the comments around, um, you know, obviously there's a there's a formal follow up, but you know the extra effort that's made to ensure that there's a a good understanding um, that the applicant has around you know where where their complaint is or is not going. So I really appreciate that because that's so important to have that understanding. Um, so last two questions, and again they're a little bit more granular and bring it a little bit closer to home. But how do we support our administrators? in having what are likely some challenging conversations around code of conduct violations. Um, so how do we support them in that? And then and then even beyond that, um, how are we supporting staff and being able to you know, recognize and then possibly address a code of conduct violation 
know, early so it doesn't become a larger issue. Uh, through the chair. Uh, so in terms of the staff and their general awareness, all new staff are provided information around all of these policies on all of the related uh, items and expected to sign off on that before they commence employment. As we go through time, as there's any changes or amendments to those policies, that those are widely communicated in the organization along with where it's appropriate examples of what it might mean and how you might deal with that. In terms of support for leaders with respect to any conversations that uh, might have to happen around this or actions they might need to take, there are uh, supported by HR advisors who are available to assist them at any point in time through that process, uh, starting with whether or not it's something they should be concerned about right through to having to take action if that's the necessary step. In some cases where there may be uh, legal implications associated with that, then there's also access to legal services, to legal advice through legal services as part of the process as well. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Close has a question. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, and, and this question might be for you or our corporate secretary. I've really appreciated the not only the questions from uh, trustees, but the answers. And when when is it appropriate in the process? Is it is this at the next meeting if trustees are interested in entertaining a motion to review and update the values on this policy and then subsequently administration would update the interpretation and indicators. Would that be at our next meeting and is it done by motion? I, I'll get uh, Ms. Miner to answer your question here. Uh, through the chair to Trustee Close. Um, so the next time this report comes in front of you, um, your, your primary de decision is whether the chief has complied, but there is always an opportunity at that time to bring forward motions and they can be um, from a perspective of that the board agrees to review this policy that you direct the chief to review the reasonable interpretation indicator. So all of those are options for you at the next time this report is in front of you at the January 11th, 2022 public board meeting. Thank you. Awesome. I will give one final call for questions before we move on from this report. Seeing no more, and this will probably help you answer your question as well, Nancy, um, or uh, Trustee Close, we'll now come to the point where trustees are asked to identify their intentions to bring forward any motions related to compliance with the operational expectations. Any trustees who wish to bring forward a motion regarding ex uh, exceptions to finding the evidence being compliant or a motion of accommodation for exceptional performance in a particular area should provide the corporate secretary and all trustees with the proposed motions by noon Thursday, January 6th, 2022. If there are no exemptions or accommodations, then this item will be placed on the consent agenda for January 11th, 2022 board meeting with the motion that the Board of Trustees approves that the Chief Superintendent is in compliance with the provisions of OE4, Treatment of Employees. Next on the agenda is item 8.1, New School Fit Up Funding. Chief UC, would you please introduce the report? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, trustees, uh, before the board today is a report requesting capital reserve funds to ensure successful learning environments for students and staff in five new schools, four of those uh, which are tentatively scheduled to open next school year, and one that will open within the next two to three years. Uh, these include one K to nine school, two elementary schools, one middle school, and one high school, all being managed by our greater infrastructure on behalf of the CBE. Uh, I will invite uh, Superintendent Breton to provide additional information and uh, to respond to your questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Chief Lucy, Chair Hack and trustees. As you have just heard, this report requests funding for the CBE team required to support Alberta infrastructure in the design and construction of five new schools on our, behind, uh, on our behalf, as well as uh, furniture and equipment that are not covered. So 
Although the government of Alberta does provide funding for eligible furniture and equipment described within the school capital manual, there are many additional expenses that are not covered. These include such items as information technology devices for students and staff, learning resources and software licenses for each school, musical instruments, career and technology equipment above the $100,000 threshold established by the government, school administration salaries to set up uh, a new school, so essentially transforming that building into a school, and funding to support the CBE capital development team, again, as, as mentioned previously, that serves as the interface between Alberta infrastructure and the CBE. So all of these items are examples of, ex of expenses not covered under the government construction grant. So as laid out within this report, it is estimated that the total value of expenses that will not be covered by the new school construction grant provided by Alberta Education, this for all five new schools taken together, will total approximately $16 million. And now with that being said, we'd be pleased to answer any questions you may have. Trustees, if you'd like to hop in the chat for questions, comments. Trustee May, would you please ask your question? Is this the first year that we're using fit up funding in this way? I'm concerned that if we're not, if Alberta infrastructure is not paying for the entirety of school building, that we may need to consider how new schools will affect our capital reserves in ways not pre previously experienced. Through the chair. Um, so, no, this is not new. Um, uh, the provincial new school construction grant. Uh, again, identified within the school capital manual, has uh, always had exclusions to it. Um, and these exclusions, as far as we're concerned, are, are essential to schools, such as computers and wireless access points so that a school has Wi-Fi. Um, these kinds of things, as well as the other items that I was describing previously, have to be funded and have historically been funded by school jurisdictions. Thank you for that. As trustees put in their questions here, I've just got a question um, in regards to the numbers on um, page three of the report. We see that there are varying amounts within each project. Um, can you just, uh, sorry, can you just give me a reason why um, some numbers are higher than others, for example, Skyview Ranch K-9 school, I'm assuming because it's a large school that it needs the most funding, but if you can just explain why the numbers differ, um, that, that would be great. Certainly, Chair Hack. So the numbers you see there, maybe I'll, I'll start with the, the lower numbers. So in elementary school, um, obviously, um, maybe I, I should back up a, a step and talk about how the CBE um, selects the size of a school and we typically select 600 student capacity to serve the needs of about 10 to, to 15,000 residents uh, for an elementary school because we want more of those so that they can be closer to um, their home because that's what we've heard from parents is important. It also ensures again that the size of the school for that age is uh, appropriate to ensure that um, the student feels as if they're part of the community and they're known for the learner they are within that community. So these are smaller schools and that's why you see the uh, second Auburn Bay Elementary School and the Mahogany School, both elementary schools, smaller schools, elementary schools uh, with a lower value. And then we go to a middle school and you see the Auburn Bay Middle School with $2.3 million identified for funding. Why is that more expensive? Well, now for our middle schools, what we look for is approximately, or we're looking for a capacity of 900 students. And so you're seeing a larger school. So that's part of the higher costs because now you're having to get more resources, but also 
Um, at this point in time, we're now introducing career and technology foundations. And so there's additional equipment, uh, more advanced requirements to meet the needs of those learners. Um, that's also a little bit lower, though, than if you look at the Skyview Ranch K-9 school. Now, interestingly enough, our, our K-9 schools, we designed them to have the same capacity as a middle school, so they're 900 capacity, but they're a little bit more expensive because now instead of just catering to that grade 7 to 9-ish kind of zone for students, now you're actually having to uh, cater to the full kindergarten through to grade 9 continuum. So you're having to purchase a lot more uh, and, and more variety of resources while still needing the same career and technology foundations equipment and, and you know more advanced resources for the more advanced students. And so that's where you see the difference there. And certainly for the North Calgary High School, you're just seeing a very small amount there uh, because at this point in time, we're, we're not ready yet to open that school. So we're not buying equipment. But what that, uh, that funding does is allows us to have a point of contact within the Calgary Board of Education that serves as the interface with Alberta infrastructure. And so for all questions that can come up uh, during the construction, uh, whether are things like, for example, uh, whether there are noise complaints on the site. We're the owner of the site. Uh, we have a person who can reach out to Alberta infrastructure and, and attend to the concerns we're hearing from the community or conveying our requirements to Alberta infrastructure. And so they're the, the point of access to all of the resources within um, County Board of Education to help inform how the classroom should be configured, uh, what should go where, what types of equipment need to go where, so that again, um, the Alberta infrastructure knows where to bring various power outlets and different types of power, depending on the, the types of equipment. So that's where you're seeing the changes and the differences. A high school will certainly be the most expensive because of those schools are 1,800 capacity and, uh, and will of course be demanding the highest level of resources to ensure the success for those students when they leave. Perfect. Thank you. That answers my follow up as to why the high school was lower, but it's not opening for a bit. So that would be why uh, I've got a question from Trustee May. Hi there. Um, I have a question about elementary schools. Um, are we building playgrounds uh, with the Alberta Education? Sorry, let me rephrase this. Are the elementary schools listed being built with playground funded by Alberta Education. Through the chair. Um, so unfortunately, um, the new school construction grant does not include funding for playgrounds. And so um, the uh, schools that are being built currently by Alberta Infrastructure for the County Board of Education do not include a playground. Of course, um, we are able to support parents if they uh, choose to come together and uh, and either fundraise or apply for um, various funding sources that are available to them through the government for that purpose. Thank you so much. Um, I will remind trustees if you've got a question or a follow up, please uh, add it to the chat there so I can call on you. I've got uh, Trustee Bolger with a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a couple of questions in relation to hiring of administrative staff to open new schools, so principals and assistant principals. Um, I'm curious how uh, far in advance they're typically um, put in that position? And is it before or after we have a confirmed opening date um, when construction will be complete? So through the chair, um, maybe I'll, I'll start off with that we'd always bring in administrative staff uh, prior to the opening of a school. And that again serves to help transform that building into a school because it's all fine and well to simply deliver all these le learning resources, materials, furniture into the building, but somebody's got to tell us where to put that uh, so that it can actually be effective in, uh, in, in, in the, the learning work that's going to happen in that building afterwards. 
Having said that, um, opening dates um, can be difficult things to, to, to uh, confirm. Um, based on the advice that we see from Alberta infrastructure, based on our own experience, having built 27 new schools in the last five years, uh, we do get a good sense for whether or not a school will be able to open on time. And so then that helps us uh, pre-position um, the staff and, and get the purchases uh, undertaken in sufficient time to ensure the school opens. Inevitably, with any construction project, though there, there are surprises, there are uh, delays that uh, can happen. Sometimes they might not impact the opening of the school, but maybe they'll prevent the use of a certain area of the school, like a gymnasium. And so then maybe the first few weeks of the school uh, might have to be looked, you know, for physical education might have to be uh, using alternative uh, areas to be able to take that, uh, to, to make sure that that is happening. Um, so it is, I would say, though, more important to ensure that we have the staff that are ready and the equipment that is ready, material that is ready um, to open a school on September 1st, then assume that it will be late, uh, higher later, and then have everybody scrambling at the, at the very last moment. So uh, certainly uh, we typically have our, our administrative staff uh, for principal perspective, for example, coming in approximately five months prior to the opening of the school, and then gradually that number of staff builds as we get closer and closer to the opening of the school. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Trustee May. So uh, looking on page 8-4, uh, it talks about the capital reserve balance is anticipated to be 33 396. Um, is that the 3% that we're aiming for? So through the, uh, what you're looking at in the document is actually a capital reserve request. So neither the Board of Trustees nor the Alberta Education have uh, defined at this point in time a appropriate capital reserve level. So short answer, no, that is not the operating reserves that we referenced in our last meeting which are currently sitting at about 3.4%. That will be what is left in our capital reserves, uh, assuming this uh, request is approved. Thank you for that clarification. Are there any more trustees that have questions in regards to the new school fit up funding report? Seeing no more questions in the chat. Is there a trustee who wishes to bring forward a motion regarding this report? Trustee May. That the Board of Trustees approves a budget expenditure of up to $8,467,000 from capital reserves in 2021, 2022, to undertake school development and fit up for the following five schools. Auburn Bay Elementary School, Auburn Bay Middle School, Mahogany School, North Calgary High School, and Skyview Ranch K-9 School. These who have questions about the motion. Seeing no questions about the motion. The motion on the floor is that the Board of Trustees approves a budget expenditure of up to $8,467,000 from capital reserves in 2021-2022 to undertake the school, improve, uh, school development and fit up for the following five schools. Auburn Bay Elementary School, Auburn Bay Middle School, Mahogany School, North Calgary High School, Skyview Ranch K-9 School. Trustee May, would you please open debate?
So I'm obviously in support of this motion. I think it's very exciting that we're getting some new schools in. I think it's going to help our children out significantly. And I appreciate that we're putting in all the extra thought to make sure that it's ready to go right from the start of September. Thank you. Are there any trustees who would like to enter first round of debate? Seeing no one enter first round of debate. If you would like to enter uh, debate, please just type in the chat. Second round of debate. Is there anyone looking to enter? Oh, sorry, Trustee Dennis. No problem. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so I'm happy to support this motion. Um, it is always exciting for our neighborhoods to receive a new school and the fit up funding is critical to ensure that the resources are in the school that our public demand. Um, we know that the, um, the, I guess the package of materials that are maybe provided as part of the construction um, don't necessarily d meet the demands of, of the Calgary um, Calgary public. And so it's important for us to try and um, make sure that our students and our staff have everything they need to do successful learning in those buildings. So thank you so much. And also a very um, prudent decision around having administration in a place um, ahead of time and also facility staff in place ahead of time. Um, just to guide some of the decisions that are being made to be there to answer questions for families that are excited to be starting school there and also to have that support um, in the school to make sure that everything is set up and ready to go when students arrive on the first day. Thank you. Thank you. I apologize for that, Trustee Dennis. Are there any other trustees who would like to enter debate? If there are no more trustees willing to enter second round debate, trustee may do wish to close debate. I have nothing further to add. Okay. I will now call on each of you individually to indicate whether you are in favor or opposed to the motion. Trustee Bolger. Thank you. I'm in favor. Trustee Close. In favor. Trustee Dennis. In favor. Trustee Downey. In favor. Trustee May. In favor. And Trustee Vukadinovich. In favor. I also vote in favor of the motion. The motion is carried unanimously. Are there any other additional motions on this report? Trustee Close. There is an additional um, motion. I would like to move that the Board of Trustees authorizes the chair to correspond with the Minister of Education pertaining to the use of reserves. Do any trustees have questions about this motion? There are any questions you can just add to the chat. Seeing none, the motion on the floor is that the Board of Trustees authorizes the chair to correspond with the Minister of Education pertaining to the use of reserves. Trustee Close, would you please open debate? I'll, I'll keep it brief by just echoing uh, the comments and debate that other trustees have done within their oversight role uh, about the important fiscal prudence that our administration is demonstrating and of course our focus on student success and our requirement to uh, receive approval from the Minister of Education. Thank you, Trustee Close. 
for anyone um, looking to enter first round of debate. Uh, Trustee Downey. Question in um, before the question period because my chat wasn't working. Am I able oh. to ask a question now? Or we're past, it's okay if we're past that point. We're past, we have read, so the motion is now ours. Um, yes, that's fine. Okay. Thank Sorry you. about that. No, that's fine. Are there any trustees looking to enter debate? We'll go to second round of debate. Anyone ent wishing to enter? Just add comment in the chat, please. Trustee closed, do you wish to close? Trustee closed, do you wish to close debate? Uh, closed. <laughs> I will call on each of you individually to indicate whether you are in favor or oppose the motion. Trustee Bolger. In favor. Trustee Close. In favor. Trustee Dennis. In favor, thank you. Trustee Downey. In favor. Trustee May. In favor. Trustee Vukadinovich. In favor. I vote in favor of the motion. The motion is carried unanimously. Uh, that moves us to the consent agenda of our meeting. All items not removed from the consent agenda will be deemed to be approved with the agenda. Next on our agenda is item 9.2.2, 2021-2022 uh, school enrollment report. Trustee Close, I understand you have some questions on this item. I do, uh, Chair Hack, thank you. Should I just start with some questions or is there anything administration wants to say or is that the process? Yeah, you can just start with your questions. On okay. The report. The, uh, well, and I'm excited to, to uh, have pulled this from the consent report. I, I, I've shared with some that um, I'm deeply excited about reading the school enrollment report, but sometimes just don't have the mental capacity to completely understand what I'm intuitively am very excited about. So I'll start with my first question. Um, on, uh, on pages 9, 11, 9, 12, it shows the enrollment has increased uh, for CBE by 2,688 students. And I'm assuming that, that the increase, when I look at the report, go through the report, that that increase comes from kindergarten and high school. And I'm just, my first question is, am I correct? And, and, and and if there's any comments on why uh, those increases are being seen. Thank you. Through the chair. Um, yes, so I, I would draw, draw your attention to table three at page 9-10. I think it summarizes uh, the growth that we've experienced and, and some of the losses that we've experienced uh, really well within the Calgary Board of Education. So what you see there is certainly a lot of growth, essentially the, 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 the line share happening at kindergarten. And, and why is that? Um, well, I think it might have to do with the fact that one, it isn't offered online. And two, uh, we've been in a pandemic for long enough now that maybe parents are starting to feel um, comfortable that, you know, again, even though this, uh, you know, kindergarten is not mandatory for, uh, for, for students, that maybe now they're feeling comfortable enough to send their children to school. And, uh, and so that increased level of confidence in how we'll be able to keep their, their student safe uh, and, and be able to educate them. Next, what you're seeing is a little bit of, uh, of a loss in, in grades uh, one to three uh, and, and sort of modest growth uh, uh, in grades four to six and, and seven to nine. What you're seeing that there is sort of like a, I would say it's a, it's a demographic bubble that we're, move, we're seeing move. So this is also part of why we were doing the high school engagement, uh, because we do see fewer elementary school students entering the Calgary Board of Education. 
and uh, older students that are slowly tracking through our schools. And so they're moving from uh, the, the lower grades into some of the higher grades. And so you really see that hitting in grades seven to nine um, as, as the, the movement of students are from that grade four to six division uh, shifting over into the grade seven to nine division. And then, wow, what's happening in, in grades 10 to 12? Um, this is something that we see every year. And uh, I would say it's primarily attributable to the great configuration of many charter schools and private schools. Um, so in recognition of the excellent quality schools that the Calgary Board of Education has, many charter schools and, and private schools end at grade nine. And so we see a lot of students then come back to public education and, and in large numbers return to the Calgary Board of Education. Trustee Close, do you have a follow-up to that? I, I have a few follow-ups. Should I just keep going and, uh, unless people put questions in the chat? Yeah, you can ask and I will ask if you have a follow-up to okay. each one. <laughs> okay, thank you. And uh, Superintendent Breton, I was smiling throughout your whole answer because that's exactly uh, the type of story that I need to digest. So thank you very much for, for your answer. Um, my next question uh, is on 912, and it's around the enrollment for alternative programs, seeing an increase by 638. It might be in the report, and I just didn't catch it on, on my cursory read, but do we know which alternative programs are showing an increase in enrollment? Through the chair. As, so yes, we, we do have that information. Um, I, I believe in the report potentially, though it doesn't compare it with the previous year. And so that's why you're, you're asking that question. Um, what I can tell you, and but you know, so what we would have to do is compare last year's uh, attachment on alternative program enrollment with this year's to be able to actually find the difference. But to simplify things, I, I've gone through that. And what you'll see is that the three largest areas for increases were early French, um, and so uh, French immersion increasing by just over 250 out of that 638, so that's lion's share. TLC uh, from K to nine, that increased by just over 200, so now we're around 450 of that 638 uh, increase. And then science, also from K to nine, is, is where it's offered within the CBE, and it increased by just over 150 students. So I think that brings us to about 600, and then the, the 38 or so is just a, the, sort of the uh, continuous sort of up and downs that occur throughout all of uh, all of our alternative programs and throughout our school system. So just a little bit of background noise. If you Thank you for that. Um, if there are any other trustees who have questions on this uh, for superintendents, uh, feel free to jump in the chat. If not, Nancy, please continue. And and thank you again. I, I really appreciate uh, knowing that answer as far as which programs have seen the increase. So thank you for doing that comparison for me. Um, Superintendent Breton, I've asked you this question probably three times and I'm just going to keep asking it until I feel confident with the answer maybe. Um, but it's around uh, section 912, uh, not confident in your answer, but confident in my interpretation of the answer. Um, uh, around leases and capacity and utilization, um, so what I'm hearing is that leases for nonprofit organizations in our school reduce the capacity and therefore increase utilization. Is that a correct assumption that I'm holding in my brain? Chair, and yes, it is. I think it's worthwhile though that you've asked that question more than once because now maybe I'll, I'll, I'll go an additional level of information and I'll talk about full-time versus part-time leases. So it is applicable for a full-time lease. Uh, and so what is that? That is a lease where the space in the school is being used continuously by the lessee. So that space then is discounted from the capacity. And so because of the fact that the capacity of the school then is diminished, that means that you know uh, essentially the utilization rate of the school increases because it has a lower capacity. Now, full-time leases, though, uh, account for probably just a little over 
a quarter of our leases within CBE schools. What you'll see predominantly within CBE schools are part-time leases. And these are for before and after school care programs that are operating in spaces that are only used for a portion of the day. So for example, the gymnasium might be used in the morning and then the before and after a school care program will, will pack up their things and uh, then they'll set themselves back up at the end of the day. And in between, the school is using the gymnasium. It might apply also to some classrooms. Uh, and so in those cases, the space is not uh, reduced, if you want, from the total capacity of the school because the, the school is still using those spaces. And so a part-time lease, uh, the majority of the leases we have within schools do not impact the utilization rate of the school. I'm starting to appreciate the nuance. Okay. Jesse, close, do you have any more questions? Unfortunately, I do. I'm sorry. Not a problem. I do, I do love this report. Um, on 913, uh, the utilization for the system overall has decreased to 83% versus 84%. And it's referenced because of the changes related to unique settings and I think something to do with how we uh, uh, include kindergarten students. But I, I truly did not understand this. I, I, when I look at the unique settings, um, their utilization rates, like I just picked out a couple like Emily Fallensby. Um, and it was at 98%. So I didn't understand how that impacted our, and maybe it doesn't, our uh, overall uh, system utilization of uh, from going from 84 to 83. Through the chair. Um, I think I'll handle that one as well. Uh, so, Right. What we're seeing there is, is some changes in how the province is, is having us report. Um, the kindergarten piece was maybe a little bit simpler in the sense that even if it's full day kindergarten, they're still requiring us to report it as being only counting for half a student. Um, and so then that means when you're using, when you're calculating the utilization rate, uh, those students don't add up as quickly. The same thing with early development centers or early uh, learning centers. Um, those are only accounted for half. As far as the unique settings, um, again, those previously were not reported and you happen to choose one, Emily Follinsby, that has a very high utilization rate. Um, but so that, that overall um, space and number of students though, um, in comparison to, let's say a Dr. Oakley, if you would have picked that one, which is at 43% utilization, and ends up dragging the average much further down. And so, you know, the, the, the difference in percentage points between 83 or 84% and that 93% that utilization rate uh, does, you know, Emily Follinsby does help, you know, I guess increase the average a little bit, but a Dr. Oakley will really drag down. Uh, so overall ended up seeing, because of the combination of those changes, a slight reduction in the system. Okay. Um, I do see in the chat here, we have a question from Trustee May. If you'd like to jump back in, um, Trustee Close, can you please add to the chat? On page 9-18, I'm just looking at Crescent Heights School and seeing that their out of area is 547 students. Can you speak to um, why that number would be what it is? So through the chair, um, different high schools offer uh, potentially different programming. Um, sometimes different high schools also uh, might uh, attract folks simply because of the fact that, you know, for example, um, the parents may have gone to that school and even though they don't live within that designated area, uh, want to see their child go to the same high school that they went to. Um, what you're seeing there um, is also the one of the reasons why the CBE has implemented Administrative Regulation 1691, Transfer of Students, and 1690, which is around admission of students, 
to help better um, distribute students across the system and this to ensure their uh, flexibility, access and choice that they have. Because if you have a school like this one that's attracting a lot of out of boundary students, that means there's a high school somewhere that is not retaining those students. <clears throat> and just as with you know an overutilized school, uh, just the, the, the lack of physical space would end up hampering the ability to offer uh, a lot of variety of, of, of programming that students might be interested in because of the fact that there's just physically no space in the building. Um, a school that is underutilized uh, won't have the critical uh, mass of students to be able to generate the numbers required to have a class uh, of that specific programming. Um, so uh, without necessarily having done any sort of um, uh, studies as to why this particular school has such a high number of out of uh, attendance area students, um, certainly we're looking to help balance that out through the high school engagement, adjusting the boundaries and helping ensure that our schools can all offer, um, again, that flexibility, uh, the choice and the access that uh, high school students deserve uh, and, and uh, that we want to be able to give them. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Downey has a question. Thank you. Um, so on um, back to um, page seven of 10, uh, nine dash 12 of this report, um, there are two bullet points um, that say areas leased by private schools and areas leased by charter schools. Uh, Superintendent Breton, can you please expand on the numbers of the areas leased uh, by private and charter schools, please? through the chair. Um, so while I'm talking, I'm going to be calling up a document for my, uh, just my, my, my personal recollection, if you want, uh, so I can remember exactly what the numbers are. But I believe that we have 14 uh, facilities that are leased to charter schools, and um, we have a smaller number that are leased to private schools. And I And of course, it looks like my file is locked up now all of a sudden. Um, but, but certainly, uh, maybe a, a point that's worthwhile clarifying here is that when we are um, leasing these uh, facilities to um, either a charter school or a private school, uh, it, is, it is because we have been directed to by the minister. And so at that point in time, we continue to... Uh, um, uh, manage that property uh, on behalf of the school uh, with slightly different conditions whether if, you know, in comparison to a charter school which are publicly funded and so as a result uh, they would have a different set of rules as in comparison to the private um, school so I'm, I'm going through here and I think we've got two schools here that are um, private uh, schools so I do notice that uh, Trustee Downey will have a follow up to that, but I'm going to let uh, Trustee Close ask her question before we get there. I thought you were going to go with the follow up, but so I wasn't ready. Um, my last question is uh, similar to uh, Trustee Mays around the out of attendance area students, but but not just for the high schools uh, that are listed. And I think you almost answered this, but do we actually look at the out of attendance areas for division one, division two schools and find out why uh, parents are choosing uh, those schools over, over their home designated school? Through the chair. Um, so certainly beginning with this, uh, this next school year, all CBE school years will have an enrollment status um, similar to uh, high schools that indicates whether they're open, limited or closed. And that's specific 
uh, specific me measure or means for us to be able to control uh, the movement of students uh, and specifically out of attendance area students. Um, so we do uh, gather that information around the numbers of out of attendance area students, uh, but uh, the, the planning team, we have not been tracking the why behind that information. So the reasons that a student might be in one school versus another, um, there are quite a large number. Um, you know, typically the most important reason uh, but this would apply more in the, you know, at high school is programming availability and the interest of that, uh, of, uh, of that student. So I think for, for example, you know, there's nowhere else in the city that you'll get the aeronautics exposure that Nelson Mandela High School can offer. And so then that would pr probably be a, a, a draw for out of attendance area students. Um, sometimes international baccalaureate program, uh, programs can, can have that kind of draw as well. Uh, in the first, in those divisions one and two, um, the, the reasons would probably be different, uh, very, very different uh, at those levels and, and maybe revolve around uh, family circumstances or other issues along those lines. Okay, thank you. I uh, hope to give you enough time here uh, for Trustee Downey's follow-up question. Uh, thank you, uh, Superintendent Breton. I appreciate you looking up those uh, specific um, data points for me. Um, and I have a very large question to follow up with um, that you've already alluded to some of the information that's required. So given that um, school, uh, school utilization rates affect uh, funding, can you please speak to the financial benefits of leases for charter and private schools to the CBE? So um, at this time, we do not have a charter school or a private school operating within an operating CBE school. And so having said that, um, the fact that a charter school or a private school uh, is leasing a, a building from the Calgary Board of Education has zero impact upon the util utilization rates for this school jurisdiction. Um, if those schools were not being leased by the private school and or the charter academies, um, we would have been able to dispose of those facilities and we would be able to then as a result um, concentrate our efforts on managing our own property. So, where it does make a difference financially, uh, because of the fact that from a, certainly from the, the charter school perspective, uh, we're uh, obligated to lease those facilities for $1 a year. And if you add to that the fact that the board and system administration uh, for school jurisdictions is capped, um, the more of those that we have to manage, uh, and by those I mean again, uh, buildings that are uh, leased to um, either private or charter schools. It, it means it dilutes the the effort and the time that uh, my team has to manage the public schools that we have responsibility for. So for the Calgary Board of Education schools that we have responsibility for. So um, no impact on utilization, uh, but a draw on resources uh, from an administrative perspective. Thank you. Hey, are there any more questions on the school enrollment report? If you have any questions, please jump in the chat. As I don't see any more questions come forward. Um, we will conclude. Uh, the board has two labor, three land and four strategic planning matters to deal with in camera following the public portion of this meeting. That brings us to the conclusion of this portion of the agenda. I'd like to thank all of you who joined us for the meeting. Um, we'll see you in the new year. Our next public board meeting is scheduled for Tuesday, January 11th, 2022.